Cryptid Hunters, Chapter 17, The Laboco Village Marty and Grace watched with envy as Bo swung through the branches overhead, sporadically swooping down to grab Petey and take her for a joyride through the lush green canopy. Below, where the twins were, was not nearly as pleasant, with thorns stabbing their skin, vines tripping their feet, and the boggy ground trying to swallow them. For the first few hours, Marty was able to keep up a running monologue about the hippos, elephants, monkeys, and other animals they came across from his vast store of memorized wildlife documentaries. After a while, though, he fell silent. It was all he could do to swing the machete and keep the sweat bees from crawling under his netting and up his nose. Every half hour or so, they stopped to catch their breath, drink water, and check their location on the gizmo. By early evening, they were less than halfway to the sky house. Marty sat down in an exhausted heap and pulled a second bottle of insect repellent from the pack. You know, he said, slathering the smelly juice on his face beneath the netting, if I were to jump in that swamp, I bet the amount of poison on my skin would kill every fish in there. Crocs, too. He was certain that under her netting, Grace was the same sweaty mess as he was. She lifted the veil to take a drink of water. She was barely sweating. What's the matter with you? I'm carrying the little pack, and I haven't been swinging a machete all day. Marty thought that by this time, he would be carrying her as well as the backpack. That doesn't quite explain it, does it? He wiped his face with a dry shirt and wrung it out. If I were stark naked carrying nothing, I'd still be sweating like Victoria Falls. Maybe you haven't noticed, but it's a little hot in the jungle. I've noticed, Grace admitted with a worried expression. Ever since we got here, something strange has been happening to me. Like what? I can't explain it. I just feel... She tried to think of the right word. Comfortable, I guess. In that case, you can use the machete when we... A branch cracked to their right. Marty put his fingers to his lips and the binoculars to his eyes. Unbelievable, he whispered. It's an okapi with a calf. He handed the binoculars to Grace. About 50 yards away was the most unusual animal Grace had ever seen. It had a long, muscular neck, big ears, a beautiful sable brown body, and striped legs. It looks like a short giraffe. That's because it's related to the giraffe, Marty said. The pygmies hunt them for their meat and skin. It didn't become known to science until the 1900s. The first live okapi reached Europe in 1918. Before that, nobody believed they existed. Sound familiar? Sounds like another one of your wildlife documentaries, Grace answered. It is, but that's not what I was getting at. The okapi was a cryptid until somebody discovered it. Grace handed the binoculars back to him. There's a big difference between a giraffe and a dinosaur. Laurel said if we saw this area, we'd understand how a dinosaur could hide out for millions of years. Grace looked at their surroundings, the giant trees draped with thick eyes filled with chattering monkeys and birds, the soft sunlight dappled ground covered with ferns and palms. She didn't think that the area concealed dinosaurs, but... She was growing certain there were other secrets hidden among the deep shadows, secrets she wasn't sure she wanted revealed. We're not going to reach the sky house tonight, are we? De du jour, Marty said. In fact, I was just thinking this might be a good place to spend the night. The sky house isn't far as the crow flies, but we're not crows and I'm pooped. Speaking of corvids, he took the gizmo out of his pack and turned it on. The vid cam showed the Humvee pulling into a village next to the river. Marty checked the map. They're at a place called Loboco, on the Ubangi River. As Wolf and Laurel stepped from the Humvee, they were surrounded by a large group of laughing, smiling people. The men and boys wore threadbare shorts and t-shirts with more holes than cloth. The women and girls wore sun-faded shifts that had lost their form and color long ago. Several of the older Loboco recognized Wolf. They crowded around him, shouting and point pointing at his right leg. They want to know how your leg grew back, Laurel translated. Wolf exposed the miracle by lifting his trouser cuff and showing them his prosthesis. This seemed to excite the Laboco more than if he had grown a real leg back. They all wanted to touch it, which Wolf invited them to do. The last time he had been in the village, he had arrived lying on his back in a crude litter pulled by Mazalito. He didn't remember much about that visit because he had been in shock from blood loss, fever, and grief. 
the Loboco had taken care of him for more than a week until he was strong enough to be moved to a clinic run by missionaries 200 miles away. Despite his worry and weariness, he was very happy to see these kind people again. They were escorted to an empty hut to rest before a dinner in their honor with the village elder. Wolf called the twins. He was disappointed at their slow progress, but pleased with how they were holding up, especially Grace. Laurel had been right. Grace was much tougher than she looked. Grace told him that as soon as Marty, Marty finished cooking dinner, they were going to sleep so that they could get an early start in the morning. She suggested that Wolf do the same. He took her advice, which was much easier after seeing how well they were doing, and he awoke a couple hours later feeling somewhat revitalized. He found Laurel sitting with the village elder outside his hut above the river. After their simple meal, Laurel explained to the elder and fluent Laboco that they had come to find Mazzolito. He told her they had, that he hadn't seen him in several months, which was not unusual. Mazzolito only comes out of the forest three or four times a year to work as a guide. In fact, a little over a week ago, a group of men were here ho looking to hire him for that very purpose. Wolf did not understand Laboco, but the look of concern on Laurel's face was clear. What did he say? Just a second. She asked the elder how many men were in the group. Four, the elder answered. Three men from the Congo and an American. I told them that they wouldn't find Mazlito unless he wanted to be found, but they crossed the river anyway in the direction of Lake Tully. The elder laughed. Mazlito will watch and listen to them unseen. If he doesn't like what he sees, they will have wasted their time. Mazlito is like the wind coming up off the river. He cannot be caught or seen. Laurel translated. Wolf cursed. What did the American look like? Laurel asked the elder. He was a big man with brown hair on his lip and no hair on his head. The men with him were not friendly. I hope they do not return. After Laurel translated, Wolf said, Butch McCall. You know him? Wolf nodded. Butch is Blackwood's number one guy. He's ruthless and very good in the woods. I got to know him pretty well when I was working at the Ark. We didn't get along. He's dangerous, and he's had plenty of time to re reach Lake Tully. We need to get across that river. We can't cross at night, Laurel said. We're no good to the children if we drown or die from exhaustion halfway there. You know as well as I do that we have to pace ourselves. The hardest part of our trek is on the other side of the Ubangi. But if Butch finds... Laurel put her hand on his. The only people in the world who know the location of the Sky House are you and Mazzolito. And you, Wolf added. Butch McCall is looking for Mazzolito and dinosaurs, not children and tree houses, Laurel continued. Grace and Marty should reach Lake Tully tomorrow. I hope you're right. When he got back to his hut, Wolf called them on the gizmo. Hello, Marty answered groggily. Were you asleep? Yeah, I guess so. Something's come up, Wolf said, and told him about Butch McCall. Butch McCall, Marty repeated. We'll keep our eyes open for him. When you get to the Sky House, call Mazzolito with the Molimo. Wolf explained where it was and how to use it. There's a ladder a couple of trees over from the Sky House. You can use it to get up into the tree. Taped to the bottom rung is a box with the key in it. You'll need it to open the trap door. Got it, Marty said. We'll be crossing the Ubangi early tomorrow morning, Wolf continued. It's pretty rough going on the other side, and we won't be able to stay in touch as much as we have from the Humvee. Fine, Marty said. Is everything all right, Marty? Sure. What could be wrong? Wolf could have given him a dozen answers to this question, but it looked like Marty had dozed off.